May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In our gospel today, Jesus tells us a parable about a man who has two sons. The father goes to the first son and says, go and work in the vineyard today. The son refuses, but he later changes his mind and goes to work. Father went to the second son and says the same thing. The son says yes, but then he does not go. Jesus' question to the chief priest and the elders is, which of the two did the will of my father? My question to you is, with which of the two sons do you most closely identify? As always, Jesus tells this parable to convey a very subtle truth that may not necessarily be so easily heard if it were told more bluntly. Though in concluding, he is quite blunt. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to the kingdom of God ahead of you. The marginalized and the disreputable are going ahead of the respectable and the pious. The last will be first and the first will be last. To echo last week's reading, uh, last week's gospel, you see, the chief priests and the elders, the religious authorities, are not doing the will of God. At least that seems to be the implication. But let's back up a bit. Our reading picks up the morning after Jesus has triumphantly entered Jerusalem and goes into the temple overturning tables, calling it a den of robbers. Now he's back in the temple teaching, and the chief priests want to know by whose authority he's doing all of this. On the surface, it seems a reasonable enough demand. After all, Jesus has literally turned things upside down, wrecked havoc in the temple. And to be fair, we, all of us here, have the benefit of knowing the full story. These chief priests and elders, what do they know? We know how it turns out. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection tell us what we need to know about who he is. But even so, knowing that, knowing who Jesus is, may not make much of a difference to these priests and elders who have confronted him. They didn't believe John the Baptist, and they're not likely to believe Jesus, no matter what he says. Why is that? What prevents these priests and elders from seeing who Jesus is? What is it that makes them, like the second son in the parable, say yes to the Father with their lips but no in their actions? These are important questions, hard questions. They're not hypotheticals rooted in some story written 2,000 years ago. They are our questions too. What gets in the way of doing God's will? For that matter, how do we even discern God's will in the first place? I'm sure the Pharisees in their strict observance of law and tradition were completely convinced that they were on the right path. I'm sure that many of us myself included, at times feel a similar self-righteousness. But what would happen, what has happened, if you were confronted by a rabble-rouser like Jesus? What would happen if he came in here and turned things up, upside down, literally? I'm thinking you might know what that feels like. I'm thinking that at some point in your life you might have felt something like that. You might have felt something like that on a personal level, and even as a congregation here, you might have at times felt like things have been turned upside down. In our reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, 
any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Paul is writing to the community at Philippi from prison out of concern for their unity. And in his words, I think we can find something that points us toward an understanding of how we are called to live out God's will for us. Even though Paul is imprisoned and facing possible execution, he is sustained by his participation in Christ's self-emptying love for others. It is a love that burns with desire for the flourishing of others, a love whose joy can be made complete only when all are included. And he wants the Philippians to share in that love. That's what it means when he says, make my joy complete. And he lays out what that means fairly clearly. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. That is the self-emptying love of Christ. That is the fellowship shared when we live in Christ. Now, this would have been a radical message in the first century Mediterranean world. It's a radical message today, if you think about it. Lists of vices and virtues were common both in, in Greek and Hebrew culture, just as they are today. Just as they are today, love was superior to hate. Harmony was better than fighting. But humility, humility in the ancient world was a weakness. Making yourself appear strong, saving face, was of the utmost importance. One who was humble appeared weak. And yet, Paul listed here as a virtue. In fact, it seems to be an essential virtue. And it's the opposite of what the larger culture values. And so here we are. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. This is not a call to impersonate Jesus. Impersonators go to, to great lengths to make people believe that they are something that they are not or someone that they are not. Something like the son in Jesus' parable who pretends to be obedient but fails to do as promised. No. Paul is urging us to be imitators of Christ. Imitators are clearly aware that they must strive to live up to the challenge of being a reflection of of the person that they look up to, the person that they want to imitate. It's not about looking like something you are not. They work at it. We work at it. The first son in Jesus' parable says, no, I won't do it, or no, I can't do it, but then ends up obeying his father in the end. Has that ever happened to you? God calls you to work and you say, I can't, then with prayer, then with God's help, you say yes, you do that work, you turn. Last week in my sermon, that's how I characterized repentance, a, a turning back toward God. The tax collectors and the prostitutes that Jesus mentions heard John the Baptist preaching the word of God and repented. The priest and the elders, however, held tightly to their own willfulness. And that's an important distinction. Are we willing or are we willful? Do we cling to our own sense of pride or honor, cling to our own agenda, or are we willing to humble ourselves, to empty ourselves? Ezekiel says, 
cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. This is one of my favorite lines. This is one of my favorite, favorite thoughts that I hold very close. Get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Let go of what has been and be renewed. That's what it means to turn. That's what it means to live. Amen.